As the story goes, in 1881, the astronomer Simon Newcomb realized that earlier pages of his logarithm tables were much more worn than other pages. He concluded that the numbers with leading digits 1 or 2 must occur more frequently in his computations than others. It was rediscovered in 1938 by the physicist Frank Benford, who analyzed the data of hundreds of rivers, city populations and molecular weights. The main statement goes as follows. Whenever there is data that stretches almost scale invariantly over a large range of orders of magnitude, the distribution of leading digits is given as follows. In about 30% of the values, the leading digit is 1. All other digits occur with decreasing probability. Look at the following two integer sequences. Although different in nature, they will both approach Benford's law perfectly as the number of counted digits increases. In this video, we study the geometry of the trajectories of a ball on a circular billiard table. Surprisingly, this little adventure will hold the key for understanding Benford's law. Due to the enormous symmetry of the configuration, the geometry of the billiard ball is completely defined by the value of one single parameter. For convenience, we choose the deflection angle theta between the trajectory and the tangent to the circle at the reflection point. We can observe that at each reflection, the direction of the path changes by 2 times theta. In the simplest situation, the ball traces the shape of a regular n-gon. We find that 2 times n times theta is equal to 2 pi, and the trajectory closes after n reflections. We say that theta is a rational multiple of pi. So far the numerator in the rational multiple was equal to 1. When the numerator is different from 1, the billiard table still shows the same reflection points, whose number is given by the size of the denominator. But this time the path does not connect adjacent reflection points, but rather skips a few of them, depending on the value of the numerator. In general we find star-like shapes, and similar to the previous video, we find degenerate trajectories when the fraction is not in its simplest form, where numerator and denominator are co-prime. What happens if the angle is an irrational multiple of pi? Since there is no finite denominator in this case, we expect infinitely many different reflection points. It does not come as a surprise that the trajectory will not close in this case. Moreover, the infinitely many reflection points are dense and uniformly spread across the rim of the entire billiard table. It's not difficult to prove this. From the fact that the path does not close, we know that one reflection point after a full turn must be closer to the starting point than any of the so far equally spaced reflection points of the first round. We can consider this smaller interval as a new regular interval that is placed uniformly around the table. Again, this smaller interval will not close, and in this case its overlap will form an even smaller interval. This process can be continued indefinitely, leading to ever smaller intervals and dense and uniformly spaced reflection points. We now possess enough geometrical understanding to explain the nature of Benford's law for the powers of 2. We somehow have to find a bridge from the ever-growing numbers to our circular billiard table. This bridge arises computationally. We start with an arbitrary power, take 16 for example which is the same as 2 to the 4. It can be sandwiched between 10 and 20. The two bounds can be expressed by the leading digit and its successor, multiplied by a power of 10. This way the connection between the powers of 2 and their representation in base 10 materializes. Let's write the same sentence for a generic power of 2. It reads as follows. Where the 4 is replaced by n, the leading digit by a small d and the letter k encodes the order of magnitude. Now it's time for the magic moment of this presentation. We feed these inequalities through the logarithm of base 10. This logarithm turns products into sums and powers into products. Let's go on a short sidetrack to better understand this almighty weapon. 
Before the invention of calculators or slide rules, the logarithm was the best bet to perform tedious computations. Have a look at the following task, 46 times 3 for 5. Instead of performing a cumbersome and error-prone computation, we look up the logarithms for 46 and 345 and just add those two values. The book only stores the numbers behind the decimal point, the so-called mantissa. The value before the decimal point just counts the number of digits reduced by 1. 36 is larger than 10, therefore its logarithm starts with a1. 345 is larger than 100, therefore its logarithm starts with a2. The sum of the two values is 4.20058. We search for the mantissa and find the corresponding digits 1587. The leading 4 shows that we need a number larger than 10,000 and therefore the answer is 15,870. Did you get it? We just multiplied two numbers by adding the corresponding logarithmic values. This sum just had to be converted back and the actual product is obtained. Similarly easy is the computation of powers. Let's say we want to compute 5 to the 10. We look up the logarithm of 5 and multiply it by 10. Again the mantissa of 6.9897 leads to the digits 9766. And we have to add zeros until we arrive at a number larger than 1 million. We find 9,766,000, which is decently close to the true value. Let's now return to our problem with the powers of 2. The next operation is not always taught in school, but it's a piece of cake in comparison to the sledgehammer of the logarithm. We just decompose a decimal number into its integer part and its fractional part. The integer part is usually called floor value and the fractional part is denoted with the curly braces. The table in the bottom left corner reminds us that the variable d takes integer values between 1 and 9 and that the logarithms of these values are strictly less than 1. From the inequalities we can immediately conclude that the floor part must be equal to k and we can subtract this part from all three terms. This is it. We arrive at our final statement and find out that the information about the leading digits is encoded in the decimals of the logarithm of 2 to the base 10. Let's locate the logarithms on the number line and remind ourselves that these intervals correspond to the leading digits of our powers of 2. You can pause the video right now and try to put all ingredients together. Can you see how this leads to Benford's law? Although I've heard it a million times that the open unit interval can be transformed into a circle, I would have never come up with this final twist. We just wrap this interval around our billiard table. Then we push the ball at an angle theta equal to log 2 over 2 pi. It's amazing to see that each multiplication with 2 just corresponds to a reflection of the billiard ball. We start at 1, hit the wall at 2, then at 4, then at 8, then at 16 and so on. The logarithm magic has turned this exponentially growing sequence into a billiard ball on a divine trajectory. Number theory again is turned into geometry. From this particular pattern of the trajectory it becomes immediately obvious why it takes such a long time until 7 and 9 appear as leading digits for the first time. From the uniform distribution of reflection points it follows that the probability for a certain digit to occur is represented geometrically by the length of the corresponding interval. For completeness, we write down the probabilities that finalize the explanation to Benford's law at least as long as powers of 2 are concerned. The Fibonacci sequence can be treated similarly. There is a closed form for the computation of the Fibonacci numbers. For large Fibonacci numbers, the value is dominated by the first term which is just another exponential function. So we only have to replace the base 2 by the golden ratio. And we can apply the same reasoning with a different irrational angle theta to end up with exactly the same probabilities. Why does it also work for the file sizes on my computer? Well, does it work on your computer too? Here's a little Python program that you can use to find it out.
Of course, if you include directories that contain many files of roughly the same size, for instance music files or photos, this test is doomed to fail, but in all other cases, the success is very likely. It turns out that Benford's law is rather generic and holds true for a wide range of data sets. It's claimed that agencies use it to detect fake data in tax reports. Does it hold for primes? What do you think? This is your challenge. I'm happy to hear your comments on it. My part of the story is told for today. I hope to see you again. Bye bye.